Yeah. Hi. Namaste. Hello, friends. Uh, this is uh, Balaganapati Devarakonda, uh, Professor of Philosophy from University of Delhi, India. Uh, recently, I joined the University of West Indies, Jamaica, as a visiting professor of uh, India Studies Chair. Uh, before we begin this panel discussion, uh, I would like to thank uh, Frank for creating this wonderful platform, which has given us an opportunity to come together and share our thoughts. I welcome you all to this panel discussion on the changing forms of dialectic over time. History of philosophy is the history of journey of humankind's intellectual development. How, uh, what, what is it that is around us? What is the reality that we see to be around us, which is a metaphysical question? And how we understand the reality around us, which is a question of epistemology? How do we logically and linguistically articulate what we understand to be reality around us? How do we conduct ourselves on the basis of the above understanding of reality? These are the major philosophical concerns of various civilizations and cultures that existed and that continue to exist in the history of humanity. Civilizations have their own indigenous development uh, indigenously developed, nurtured logic of understanding the reality and knowledge of it that leads to the conducting of oneself. Catching hold of this logic is significant in comprehensively understanding the harmony of various aspects of human life that that particular civilization tries to visualize. Sometimes this logic, the broader logic, is articulated to, to be uh, dialectic. So when we see the term dialectic in the theme, it's, it's not just Marxist Hegelian dialectic that we are looking at. We are understanding dialectic in a broader sense of uh, logic, you know, the logic of uh, the human thought. So that, that's the broader understanding of logic that we are looking at. And this logic is different for, for uh, various civilizations. And it is not the same of the same civilization over a period of time. It also changes uh, over a period of time. We are talking of changing forms of dialectic today in this panel discussion. And uh, what is the context that demands us to look at this changing forms of dialectic? Uh, the context that we have today is uh, uh, the pandemic which has affected all forms of life, you know? and then the war, war-like situation that we have, uh, uh, which is uh, the major concern now, which is influencing the thinking of the nation as well as the individuals. And these two major uh, disjunctures that we see around us, um, uh, major forms of crisis in terms of pandemic and war, affected modes of thinking as well as ways of living of all the individuals and nations and whether this has affected the dominant ways of thinking and made this thinking to be revised is the question that we have with us and what is the future how do we visualize our future is another major concern will it be further geolocalization or a new form of socially equal globalization is the question uh, that uh, we have to address. And if we think that what we are heading towards is a new form of socially equal globalization, does it have its antecedents in the non-Western schools of thought is the concern that we have. We have a distinguished panel with us today uh, to address uh, these concerns that I have mentioned. Uh, I, uh, we, we will uh, uh, have a one round of uh, uh, opening statement by the distinguished panelists that we have today. I invite uh, Soros to give his opening statement of uh, how he sees the changing forms of dialectic in the history of uh, 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 philosophy or history of humanity. Over to you, Soros. Uh, thanks a lot, Bela. And good afternoon from Bangkok. It's 1 p.m. and 5 minutes here and uh, good uh, morning good evening for everyone my name is sorat hongradarom i 
and professor of philosophy at uh, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. And I'm also director of the Center for Science, Technology and Society at uh, Chulalongkorn University. Uh, my work has been focused on applying ancient thoughts, uh, particularly Buddhism, to contemporary problems. So um, as for the question of the changing dialectics as a result of the pandemic and, and the war that is going on, what I see is that we are uh, experiencing a kind of a compression uh, of globalization. Uh, what I see in COVID is that everything is is uh, being compressed uh, much, much uh, further, much more uh, strongly than before. Uh, we have seen vaccines being developed in record time, and, and we have seen uh, research papers being uh, published in record times, and uh, people are getting together via Zoom. You know, Zoom has become one of the most popular uh, web uh, uh, applications uh, that everybody is using. And and all these, all these, I believe, have have strong implications for the changing dialectics. And I think uh, globalization and localization plays into the uh, old philosophical debate about uh, universalism and particularism in uh, ethical theory. So, so uh, very challenging time and, and very fascinating time awaiting us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Soros, for your opening statement. In fact, uh, uh, you only spoke for two minutes, so you would have taken uh, some more time, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I invite Jenny uh, to give her opening statement. Uh, okay. addressing what is the changing form of dialectic that she is looking at. No? Yeah. Okay. Over to you, Jenny. Okay. So uh, thanks, Bella. And uh, welcome. Uh, I mean, hello from Australia. My name is Jenny McMahon. Um, I was a professor of philosophy at the University of Adelaide here. Um, but recently I've become professor emeritus here at the University of Adelaide. Now, um, it would be good to be able to draw upon the methods of philosophy in order to understand how to reconcile incompatible cultural perspectives. However, when philosophical methods are put to this task, the limitations of philosophy become apparent. My approach is to focus on that aspect of philosophical argument that eludes clear and precise articulation. And to do this, I have drawn comparisons between the way ideas are identified and communicated in the arts compared to the methods and contents of philosophical argument. So I begin with, a, with some brief words about the methods of philosophy before making a brief statement about the communicative, communicative capacity of the arts. Philosophy has always relied heavily on intuition. The philosopher seeks to make their intuitions as explicit as possible. It is only in this way that they can expose their conclusions to others' critique. The philosopher responds to critique by strengthening their reasons or evidence. This often leads to revision and so it goes. The result is a community of philosophers made up of philosophers engaged in particular questions and who contribute to how the intuitions on those questions evolve and how they are informed. The effect, strictly speaking, is that the intuitions that matter are not those of an isolated individual, but those of a similarly engaged group of inquirers. This process has always been the method of the philosopher throughout the ages of all traditions. There are things that do change though, and things that vary between traditions. For example, uh, the degree to which support for a conclusion relies on empirical knowledge, such as from the sciences, will vary across traditions and topics and the kind of questions that are considered worthy of attention change. And in turn, as knowledge advances, cultures evolve, and consequently experience changes, and so do intuitions. Also, what philosophers take themselves to be doing can vary between ages and cultures, and the relation they establish between reasons and conclusion can vary too. 
So I'm not suggesting that all philosophy is the same in method or content, but I do say that at its centre are intuitions, which the philosopher makes explicit and clear, so that the interlocutor can critique them. But my particular focus has been the contents of argument that elude easy articulation. And to access this content, I've relied on an analysis of the procedures employed by creative artists. The means by which art communicates is through suggestion, and the aim is to hook the perceiver's subjectivity. Consider that language can be used as a signal rather than a literal representation of the facts. In this case, the speaker uses phrases or expresses beliefs, which are meant to operate as a signal to the values or status they hold. But to understand the phrase, the expression or idea as that signal, requires entry into the relevant cultural group. It is like a kind of shibboleth. This is the way the arts operate. What the creative arts represent literally is quite different to what they mean for those enculturated into the relevant norms and conventions. But more than this, in various subcultures or worlds within art worlds, many practices can be adopted to signal one's virtues or status within that world. This is not unlike philosophy, but art operates by evoking subjective responses. It does this with the view of sharing those responses rather than inviting you to isolate yourself in your own private reverie. Philosophy, in contrast, tries to nail down such responses by naming them and then curtailing what can be considered under that name. Consequently, philosophy can seem to have greater transparency and greater communicative capacity, but traditionally it has shown less awareness of the cultural specificity of its operations. So I'll return to this issue and its significance uh, when I make up when I make some sort of final summing up. So that's all I'll say now. Yeah, that's that's so wonderful. Uh, you you were stressed that you were laying on intuition you know, and also the relation between uh, the way intuition and reason are to be placed. That, that's very uh, fundamental to the uh, base of uh, dialectic that we are talking about, forms of dialectic that we are talking about. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jenny, for that. And I now request uh, Gare to uh, give his opening remarks. Uh, what are the changing forms of dialectic that you have identified for our discussion today? Uh, over to you, uh, Gare. Please introduce yourself and then present your opening remarks within three minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's nice to be here and nice to meet all of you. Uh, good morning from Iceland. Uh, I am K. Sivuson, a uh, professor of uh, Chinese studies at, at the University of Iceland. Um, I'm, I'm trained in philosophy and all my research are in philosophy, especially comparative uh, Chinese Western philosophy normally. So I think the there are some good questions being asked in the uh, description of this uh, panel. Um, and uh, one, one of the questions is that whether we look at um, look more towards uh, philosophy, or we have uh, a resurgence in philosophical thoughts, uh, uh, considering our situation in the world. Well, I think um, maybe unfortunately for philosophy at least, uh, that when radical practical challenges arise like the ones that we are facing now, uh, then usually people are looking for practical solutions rather than philosophical ones. Uh, and I'm using though practical sort of tongue in cheek because I think philosophy often turns out to have the most practical suggestions, especially when uh, considering the long run. But um, uh, un unfortunately, people are not looking so much towards philosophy. But um, uh, though I think the sort of post COVID global philosophy situation is still unclear, I think it's uh, still quite certain. And I think we have probably all uh, experience that uh, people have been have started asking themselves all kinds of different questions that uh, are probably uh, philosophical to some extent, uh, especially uh, questions about well the uh, value of life, uh, about uh, how to make uh, proper priorities in in their lives, uh, about the different values in life. 
um, uh, ensuring also that people have, have time and, and obviously health rather than money and so on. Now, uh, I think these sort of questions were, of course, already present, and I especially noticed them uh, with the younger generation, so with my, my students. Uh, these are, of course, people who have grown up in a globalized world, uh, a world where the information flow is very fast and it travels wide. Um, and uh, in my view, these people have already shown a, a much more interest in philosophy originating in, in other parts of the world, uh, whether it's uh, Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Islamic, African, South American, and so on. So, yes, the question is, uh, is there going to be further geolocalization in philosophy, or can we expect to see the emergence of a global philosophy that doesn't make a difference between the origins of the philosophy in question? Well, I think that we are uh, already seeing a kind of globalized or at least more globalized philosophy emerging. Uh, it has many different names. We, we talk about post-comparative, uh, intercultural, cross-cultural, global, and so on. Some people, of course, claim that these terms do not have the same meaning and uh, then uh, that we need to distinguish them from each other. But um, so this is this is really happening uh, for sure. Uh, and it has been happening, especially in the last 30 years or so, to a much greater extent than, than ever before. But there are uh, a few obstacles or, or limitations to this development. And, uh, and I would like to just point them out very, very briefly. Uh, first, uh, philosophy has always been global to some extent. Uh, there has always been philosophical exchanges between uh, at least nearby cultures. Uh, we can take Buddhism and Chinese thought as an example, which goes back 2,000 years. Um, but not all cultures engage in such inter interchanges equally. For instance, I would say that there is probably not so much going on between uh, Chinese philosophies and African philosophies. Secondly, uh, philosophy tends to be valued, unfortunately, based on the power, especially the economic power of the culture that it belongs to. So Western philosophy has been studied everywhere in the world in the past 200 years. Now many are turning their attention to Chinese and some to Indian philosophy, um, probably uh, because of the increased global power of these cultures. Third, global philosophy is extremely complicated. Uh, it often requires linguistic and, and cultural competence that is very, very hard and very time consuming to acquire. So misunderstandings and misinterpretations are quite uh, frequent. Still, it is my view that we should keep on encouraging uh, such philosophy. Um, and I, I think a conscious and a responsible approach to uh, all the contingencies of practicing global philosophy simply increases the advantages of philosophical openness. And that's what we need in the present world. We need more philosophical openness. We cannot just rely on Western philosophy, uh, also because uh, philosophy is always a, a kind of a cultural expression, and we cannot just have um, um, a, a cultural expression that only represents uh, one or very uh, limited uh, 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 cultures uh, in the world. Um, we are... One thing that's important, uh, I'm almost done here, but uh, one thing that's really important or, or difficult with uh, uh, practicing uh, comparative or global philosophy is that we are often dealing with terms that originate in, in other and, and often in very alien traditions. And even though we may misunderstand it in the beginning, the, the more we engage with it, the better understanding and sense of it we will acquire. And so it will have enriched our world. So lastly... Uh, I think engaging with other philosophical traditions also serves to uh, as, a, as a kind of a mirror in which we can view our own culture from a very different angle. And we can discover aspects of our own culture that would be more difficult to see from within. Um, uh, the, uh, the American, late American philosopher Henry Rosemont said, and I'm going to end with, with uh, uh, this quote, he said, the more openly and deeply we look through a window, into another culture, the more it becomes a mirror of our own. Thank you. Uh, you are muted, Bala. 
yeah thank you so much again for that uh, lucid presentation uh, of your view and where you have very well stressed the importance of non western philosophical perspectives uh, uh, in your uh, presentation now i request uh, alan to uh, uh, speak on uh, uh, what what is uh, her discovery of the changing form of dialectic that she wants to present to to us uh, please go ahead uh, yeah thank you bala and uh Hello everyone, this is Alan Chang from Hong Kong. Uh, I'm a professor and also uh, the head of the Department of Religion and the Philosophy in Hong Kong Baptist University. And also I'm the director of Center for Applied Ethics. Um, my research area include Chinese and comparative philosophy and also applied ethics, um, basically uh, biomedical ethics and ethics of war and peace. Okay, I, I like to address the question raised by Bella earlier uh, by uh, relating it to the question that I would like to explore. That's the future of, of cosmopolitanism. Okay, as a, a political as a political philo philosophical term, a cosmopolitanism has re-emerged in the humanities and social sciences in recent decades, especially in the context of the recent refugee crisis in Europe. The philosophy of so-called hospitality, along with the counting notion of a cosmopolitan right beyond the national borders, has been enthusiastically embraced and critically re-explored in the political and the ethical discussions. Um, as we see in the, in the works of contemporary, like say, French philosopher, uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas and uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, American philosopher, uh, philosopher Martha Nussbaum sees practicing hospitality as a basic civic and moral virtue in the process of, of cultivating humanities to attain world citizenship. Uh, yet, uh, Kawai Anthony Appel, a British philosopher, addressed a similar issue but with a much more critical uh, mind when he talks about a socially and culturally situated nature of a cosmopolitan process and ask this question, what does it mean to be a citizen of the world? What do we all strangers by virtue of our shared humanities? Kant's cosmopolitan utopia concerns with the humanity in general with its emphasis on the universalistic orientation towards fulfillment of human capacity especially rational moral agency. Yet such kind of uh, notion of cosmopolitan has been criticized for its a Eurocentric, um, Eurocentric exclusivity and also idealistic tendencies, as well as for its ignoring the controversies or clashes, clashes in the process of globalization today. So what I'm trying to do uh, um, here is try to respond to the question about future of cosmopolitanism uh, from uh, from a Buddhist, I mean, from the Eastern tradition, and, and in my this particular paper, I'm trying to address the issue from Buddhism. Um, but I have to acknowledge that um, that uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in a sense, that Buddhism. Okay, because I'm also doing Chinese other philosophies like Confucianism. I have to admit that there's a lack of a notion of so-called one world in the sense of a political sovereignty in Buddhism. Uh, uh, like the Chinese term in the Confucian notion of Tianxia, or under heaven. And also Buddhist notion of the, uh, the concept of interconnectedness does not directly lead to its role in the preservation of the un of so-called unified territory and integration of the people identified with the ter territory. However, I want to push, see how Buddhism uh, can play a role to address the notion of the future of cosmopolitanism because I do recognize there are certain issues in Buddhism which can contribute to the current discussion. For example, the Buddhist notion of, of uh, you know, talk about self, relational self, rather than this uh, absolute, you know, um, autonomy, and talk about this interconnectedness, talk about, uh, you know, compassion, 
uh, across the board, you know, this notion of hospitality can be also uh, understood through, uh, um, through the, per, uh, you know, from the perspective of the Buddhism. So, so that's what I try to say, because we are facing the crisis of globalization and also the crisis of a pandemic. So I would like to see how Buddhism, uh, it, its view on so-called the, the, the world as an interconnected web can, can like look at the whole thing, uh, you know, from the Eastern, you know, philosophy. That's what I try to do. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Ellen, for bringing in uh, uh, initially the cosmopolitan perspective and then uh, bringing in Buddhism into the discussion and trying to enrich uh, the discourse. Thank you so much for that. And I now invite uh, uh, Alessandro uh, uh, to give his uh, opening remarks. Uh, please introduce yourself and then give your remarks, Alessandro. Over yes, to you. Thank you very much. I apologize for being a bit late. I was having a quarrel with technology as usual. No uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Alejandro Valega. Uh, I'm a Latin American philosopher and decolonial philosopher, and I work in the United States. Um, the, my, my, my central point is just about the necessity of establishing what I call a South-South dialogue and the foundations for such a dialogue. That is, the, the possibility of thinking uh, between ourselves, uh, between us, between ha uh, bes uh, without having to go through the North which would mean North American and Europe in order to get our papers and our credentials and be worthy of, of thought and discussion. So uh, that's what I want to encourage the most. But to say that is to say a lot if I do not uh, explain at least what my position is. And I think that my position is that there is a possibility for, for what I would call a transmodern philosophy. And I would call it transmodern because... I believe that modernity, the project of modernity from the French Revolution and before that, of course, uh, has to, and Descartes, of course, has to do with an ego, ecological kind of thinking that defines subjects as rational uh, agents, willful rational agents that are engaged in a, a kind of calculative and productive uh, rationalism. I think that this has collapsed in our times, and it has not collapsed by virtue of the self-critique that that uh, figure of freedom of that ecological thinking has done to itself, but it has to collapse, collapse from the outside. So give, let me give you four examples. One is the pandemia. I think that the pandemia really shows that there is a need for a, for a thinking that does not cut out the spiritual and the body from the rational. So the body, uh, the mind-body problem is a thing is something that does not work when one tries to engage something like pan the pandemic, and I like to uh, think with the last talk um, humbly because I don't know Chinese, but I understand that there is a concept in Chinese that is hard mind, and I think that thinking with hard mind is very much what is called for in our times, and that is beyond the subjective rationalism of modernity. Uh, my, uh, also going with that is the kind of irrationality that has become apparent in relation to uh, the pandemic. There is a kind of individualism that allows itself to make arguments for irrationality and carries a kind of violence and an ignorance of the whole context, ecological context. So that is a very pro uh, one problem that I think opens up beyond the subjective uh, humanism. The second one is the political movements that we saw. Right before the pandemic, there were political movements like, like the Yellow Jackets in, in, uh, in France, like the Sardines, the Sardines in, in Italy, movements in Chile, in Latin America. And they all had something in common. People that came to the streets, millions without the leadership of political Paris, parties and simple, uh, single caudillos, single leaders that would carry a vision. So it becomes a question of building from a community and out of the necessities that are grounded in the community rather than identifying that with a system of representation. And that there's a whole transformation there we would need to do. The third point is uh, the, 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 the ecological crisis. The ecological crisis is beyond the human and is resituating us right? in a way that, again, 
is an unsettling or a displacement of this uh, uh, subjective humanism. And the last one is, of course, decolonial consciousness and the way in which the center does not hold anymore in the terms of subjective rationalism what would be uh, the epistemic possibilities for understanding. So that we have the periphery, the excluding knowledges that begin, begin to appear and to begin make horizons for political movements and, and uh, social movements in our times. And, and a quick example would be something like Latin American movements, for example, the, the Zapatistas uh, and the movements also that elected Evo Morales to his presidency in Bolivia. So my, my, uh, the heart, at the heart of all of this is the point that uh, there is a collapse of this subjectivism and rationalism that is uh, based on this willful subjectivism. So what does, what does that mean for us? I think that this opens up a space, a possibility for us to think in an, in not an ecological, but an ecological way, right? So an ecological way that has to do with a thought that opens to cosmological dimensions, with the way in which we can run, uh, ground our thoughts, not only on rationality, but also on the aesthetics levels of understanding. Aesthetic, I mean, affective, memorial, embodied ways and knowledges that are inseparable from the rational, but that inform our traditions. And I think all of us would share, if anything, this understanding that is broader than this closure of the possibility of human freedom in subjective rationalism. So I, I'm saying that there is a, a new way, there are new and, and latent ways in which we can find new configurations for subjectivities that are developing and participating in a consciousness that is actually uh, uh, participating in the what I would call the concrescent or the happening of existence, right? And of course, this this is very general, but I just want to say that I think that the possibility of that new subjectivity comes from us, from our dialogues. No one can do it alone. And at the same time, we don't need any more that subjective center and that defines us. And so spirituality, embodiment, and thought can, I would say, dance together and live together in, a, in ways that are very much productive to our thought. That's, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alessandro, that, for that wonderful presentation. Your focus on subjectivity and subjective rationalism is very important for us, especially the distinction that you are bringing between uh, egological and ecological. That's, that's uh, what has attracted my attention <laughs> strongly. Thank you so much for that. And we had the first round of uh, 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 discussion, friends. And in fact, uh, we have exhausted maximum time by now. <laughs> it's already 33 minutes that we have exhausted. And all of you have taken more than five, uh, at least five minutes, except uh, Soraj. So we should give in the second round maximum time to Soraj. And then uh, probably all of you will have two, two minutes, right? So that uh, we can complete it. I'm sorry for the uh, time constraint, but we have to... Uh, go with that. No, we cannot uh, exceed that. So over to uh, Suraj, uh, you have heard our friends talking about uh, their own perspective of uh, 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 forms of uh, uh, dialectic and would you like to uh, expand what you want to say and also address the other friends. So you have uh, yes, yes. Uh, four minutes at your disposal, four to five minutes. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. And uh, I've learned a lot from the talk and I would like to uh, answer your question about uh, do we now note a resurgence in philosophical thoughts? I think this is a very important question and uh, it's a question that I cannot answer definitively uh, right now because we have to wait and see but but uh, we can at least think about the general form and the uh, the kind of form of uh, resurgence that we would like to see uh, normatively. Uh, and I fully agree with, with uh, what we have said so far. Uh, I fully support the idea of South-South uh, dialogues, interaction, and kind of uh, interaction between, for example, Chinese and African philosophies. And I would like also to add uh, to, to this interaction, Southeast Asian, philosophies, uh, meaning Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, this, this region of the world. 
which has been rather neglected in you know philosophical discussion globally and what i would like to add is that philosophy is a result of a time and a place so when we have uh, the changing global circumstances for example covid and the war uh, such as uh, is happening in ukraine uh, new forms of thought uh, naturally arise but i don't know uh, what what kind of thought uh, will will arise you know in, uh, in fact because we have to wait and see as i said but but uh, philosophy is kind of a reflection by a culture when they think about uh, the meanings of you know whatever empirical condition that members of that society find themselves in and uh, of course uh, during this age cultures uh, are interacting with one another very very intensively and i have talked uh, earlier about you know the advent of technology uh, like it or not uh, you know zoom application and and so on and the fact that we are collaborating and we are talking with one another i cannot emphasize this enough it, it has a lot of philosophical implications it's a, a afternoon in thailand and very late at night in north and south america and so on but we are all together at the same time and it has implications on questions of globalization and and localization and and also of you know the kind of philosophy that is emerging what i can uh tell uh is that the kind of philosophy that is emerging will not be confined to one particular geographical region uh it has to it, it is distributed but but you know we we have to uh think together and and we as philosophers are shaping uh, the form that is emerging thanks thank you thank you sonas for completing it <laughs> within the time and uh, i request jenny uh, do you have uh, anything further to add to what you said because you you just have two minutes probably one minute because yeah, okay. uh, we have only seven more minutes waiting for us which means all of you have to complete so one and a half minute for you jenny please go ahead okay um i just say that uh, increasingly i think the notion of subjectivity is going to become very important in philosophy and it's not a nameless uh, subjectivity it's the idea of a lawful subjectivity um uh too often you know subjectivity is treated as idiosyncratic and uh, whimsical but in fact uh, it's an intersubjectivity that we operate on um all the time and often in philosophical argument it's not uh, given its due it's not fully recognized and if we can recognize and understand that better i think that uh, a lot of philosophical argument will be able to be wound back to let more people in to the picture and rather different conclusions might be drawn um so that's my concluding argument i think <laughs> my con- concluding thought actually <laughs> thank you thank you for that uh, uh, now i request gair uh, gair would you like to add something uh, to what you said and well, what others have said maybe maybe just reflect a little bit on you as well please go ahead excuse me Yes uh yeah I would just like to reflect a little bit on what what has been said uh, I think it's very important to integrate resources from non-western philosophy into the the dialogue the global dialogue there there are like Alessandro has pointed out uh, real problems uh, embedded in western philosophy especially mainstream western philosophy although in, on the periphery you you may have uh, very critical views of mainstream philosophy that are are uh, important also to take into account but we do need some kind of new metaphysics uh, different kind of metaphysics that we can gain from different traditions we need other ways of seeing the world and also like alessandro said how we see the self so i, I very much uh, endorse uh, his uh, idea of uh, not being ecological but ecological it's important 
And this we can get from Buddhist uh, interconnectedness, like uh, uh, Ellen said. Uh, you can also find this in Taoism. Uh, and you have this idea of relational self, which is very important uh, for solving the ecological crisis. Now, the, the, the difficulty is how to make this happen. Uh, sort of, <laughs> how do we change the world? Uh, and, and the only solution I have is that um, like the more exposure we have of other views of the world, of, of other traditions, uh, the better and it has to be on a kind of an egalitarian basis. So what I uh, suggest is more globalized education. And uh, I also endorse your, your idea, Alessandro, about the, the, the South, South dialogue is very good, that we don't have to go always through the mainstream Western dialogue. I mean, I think this is what also excuses these uh, uh, many of these uh, values and ideas that we could get from other parts of the world. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you Gail, for that. No, you, you almost summed up everybody's arguments. Uh, Ellen, uh, would you like to add? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what you have already said, the importance of, uh, you know, having global philosophy and also the importance of cross-culture interpretations and the issues that you just um, raise, like subjectivity, the question about body and mind, you know, the non-duality, and also, you know, what, what I like the word, you know, uh, you know, uh, ecological rather than e e ecological. But I, I want to add one thing. I would like to, you know, emphasize that, uh, you know, philosophy is not just something that uh, like a mental uh, entertainment we enjoy in our academic world, like every time. I think the philosopher really, we can play very important role today in the changing world to address the real issue in the world today to offer something very important, like the classical philosophy done, that philosophy should play a key role here. Yeah, that's what I want to add. That's great. That's great. Thank you, uh, Ellen. Um, we'll uh, move to Alessandro. Uh, Alessandro, would you like to add uh, something more to what you said and also in, re in response to other friends? Yes, very, very quickly. Thank you for all your comments. I, I have to say that I think that waiting and seeing requires listening. And I think that the, the skill that we bring, that we can all bring because of our positions epistemically in the world, that we are capable of listening in ways that the center cannot. So we have a, a gift of listening and sharing that gift of listening, I think it would be also very important. The other thing is that I completely agree that this has to be a situated thought. And this means to me a kind of distinctness that doesn't reduce difference to sameness in the in in order to make sense, but we have to be more dialogical. I think, for in my, in my view, right. So, and this brings up the question of the subject and the way in which the subject is redefined in a dialogue, in a real way, in a situated way, in a concrete way. And that's all I have to say. And thank you because I'm moved by what you're saying. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Alessandro, for summing up, you know, closing, uh, your, for your closing remarks. Uh, in fact, friends, it's a very fruitful uh, plenary, uh, I mean, uh, panel discussion that we had. And uh, we have stressed the importance of looking at the alternative resources, I mean, resources from Western philosophies. And then we also uh, stressed the importance of uh, the subjectivity and uh, intersubjectivity. Uh, and also need for locating or identifying the uh, different kind of metaphysics than the dominant metaphysics that is existent. No, it, it's it's not that the other meta other forms of metaphysics do, do not exist, but it is that we have to bring them into the discourse. You no, know, that's that's one of the major uh, concerns. For example, the philosophies of uh, India and China um, and other parts of the uh, Eastern world they don't form part of philosophy departments in the West. They majorly form department, uh, the part of uh, uh, either religious studies or uh, East Asian studies. You know, that's one of the major drawbacks that we see. And it's not just different metaphysics, even the uh, epistemology. You know, the way that, that's why I was saying uh, every civilization has its own way of, uh, has its own logic of understanding the reality and the knowledge of that reality, which gets exhibited in the articulation uh, in the form of uh, language or in the form of action, which is very unique to each of these civilizations, which we have to look at. 
and this is where the distinction that uh, alessandro has made between uh, ecological and ecological is very important and also uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, stress that ellen has laid on uh, philosophy the importance of philosophy uh, thank you so much I, i think we have already crossed the time so <laughs> we should end it here uh, but i i thank each one of you for your wonderful thoughts putting them together and uh, 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 i think we should end it here because we have uh, already exhausted the time thank you so much to uh, all of you and also thanks to frank for this wonderful opportunity thank you thanks thank you thank you, thank you. bye 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 thank you